Okay then, well good morning everyone or good afternoon or good evening depending on where you're at. This is uh, System Center Orchestrator Frequently Asked Questions. We've had a, um, uh, this is one in a series, uh, Accelerus Presents, and uh, last month we presented Frequently Asked Questions Relative to System Center Service Managers. This, this month we turn our attention to Orchestrator. Our featured speaker is James Thielen. Um, so James, uh, uh, any uh, comments on what you're going to present out of the gate? Yeah, most of, most of the stuff is sort of gleaned from my experience and stuff that, that folks have asked me on customer sites, stuff that I've heard in um, training sessions, that sort of thing. And, and these, are the, these are the most common, you know, questions that I hear, that I hear people ask. Um, and so hopefully I'll, I'll address those. And if, if we have time at the end, you know, if there's any other questions that folks have, I'd be happy to answer those as well. So this session is entirely about, you know, the, the, que the common questions that folks have about Orchestrator. Okay. And if there's questions on orchestrator and service manager integration, uh, Pete and Nick are on the call as well. Uh, or if you have further questions with regard to system center orchestrator, uh, you know, please feel free to use the chat box. Um, we'll have a Q&A at the end. And also, um, when this uh, session is done, we're going to shortly thereafter, we'll post this session as uh, where all the other sessions are, which is at uh, youtube.com forward slash Accelera. So uh, go ahead and take it away, James. Sounds good. So, what are we going to cover? It's all about it's all about Q and A today. So, uh, let, let's get right into it. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. So, the the most common, believe it or not, the most common question that I hear is people people see presentations about Orchestrator. They see they see what it is, and they still are sort of confused about what you're supposed to use it for. What, what, what Orchestrator really is, and I, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, you know, I, I love with Dave about this, which is I kind of call it a, a sixth generation development environment. And, and really all it is is a mechanism for delivering, uh, you know, I hate to define the term or the term, but really orchestra, orchestrating business process. It, 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 it's designed to take a fairly complex business process that traverses a bunch of technologies and sometimes even you know manner people that are people involved and, and to automate it uh, for example um, pro typically provisioning um, systems in an environment um, that, that business process if you want to talk about provisioning you know whether, whether it be VMs or, or physical boxes or whatever typically that mechanism involves you know, dealing with the network team, it involves stuff that has to be done in storage systems, it involves stuff that has to be done in the network, it involves stuff that has to be done with inside, you know, the, 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 the VM host, it, and a lot of times, you know, there's a ticket created, and then the ticket's handed off, and there's a bunch of people involved. Um, in theory, right, <clears throat> as long as all of the systems that you're dealing with are, um, are exposed in some way that that can be you know programmatically accessed. For instance, if 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 you you keep your IPs in a, in a SQL database, or and if your your storage systems have APIs, if if all of that is true, then you could literally automate that entire process or, or most of that process with Orchestrator. Um, same thing, you know. Same thing for you know complex things like um, you know self healing. You know, you could automate a troubleshooting guide or, or, or that sort of thing, and basically somebody can push a button and, and do all the steps that it takes that are, that are recommended in, in, in a knowledge article troubleshooting guide to, to remediate an issue. There, there's a number of those types of scenarios, and that's what it's really intended to do is it's intended to integrate with, you know, both third-party systems and homegrown systems and traverse a bunch of things to to, to complete a, or to at least to the best of your ability to automate an end-to-end -end business process. Yeah, and I think uh, just to comment on that, while there may be more higher end integration packs, etc., cetera, um, the low end, I can drop uh, bits uh, of data in a directory that can be then picked up by Orchestrator or vice versa. I can drop, Orchestrator can drop bits into a directory that can be then picked up by uh, your third party application. Um, that level of low level of uh, sort of Luddite uh, data interchange is available. And so you can use it as a kind of a glue between a bunch of disparate systems to get an end-to-end -end process. Um, obviously, the, the higher end you can go with using integration packs instead of that kind of low-level stuff is great. But um, barring that, if you've got an oddball system that can 
that can throw a CSV into a into a directory, you, you've got something going on. So. Yeah, and, and it's a visual development environment. I mean, yes, what Orchestrator does can be done with a massive amount of programming and, you know, C or, or whatever, but the nice thing about Orchestrator is it's sort of, like I said, it's sort of that, that sixth generation language where you basically you're dragging and dropping these objects that already have all of the necessary components to them to do the integration that you want so you don't have to dev them yourselves, right? Yeah. The major question I get or we hear is, you know, what? where is the developer community for, for Orchestrator? Um, and, and folks that aren't aware of it, there's you can download integration packs from Microsoft Online. You can also there's also a fair large developer community on Codeplex. It's just www.codeplex you know forward slash orchestrator. Um, but there's another there's not there's a bunch of developer communities springing up around. And honestly, if you just Google or whatever, you know orchestrator, you know the developer community, you'll get a lot of hits and uh, the nice thing about it is that there's a lot of community projects people are developing these run books and exposing them in these communities and it, and it really does save a lot of time um, I, I would highly recommend that you know if you're looking at a project or think about doing a project in, in orchestrator that you take a look out there first to see what's out there because um, I, I'm from I'm a firm believer in you know time to market the, the faster you get there the better and you know if people have developed stuff that you can use I mean I'd use it um, and so um, there is a huge there is a huge developer community out there. The the, the most significant one, honestly, is on Codeplex, but there, there's a bunch of other ones out there as well. Does Microsoft support third party and community developed integration packs? Well, it, it depends. It, honestly, that that's one of those. It depends um, on what you mean by support. Do they will they help you debug the the, the use of them? No. Um, they do support the community, obviously. They, they, they're, they're active participants in that community. Um, but as far as if, you know, <clears throat> can you call them up and say, hey, I'm, I'm using, you know, this community developed run book. Can you help me do this? It, I mean, it kind of depends on what your um, support agreement is with them. But, but the sort of the base level one, it would be a no, right? They're, they're not going to, they'll support their own, their bugs with their own integration packs, but they're not, they're not going to help you with bugs with, with third party and, and community developed integration packs or, or run books, uh, unless you've got a support agreement with, with them that's, uh, that's pretty high level that they'll basically do whatever it is that you ask them to do. Um, but, but sort of at, at the baseline, no, I mean, you can't, you can't just call up and say, hey, but, but as far as the Microsoft ones that are, are, are concerned, they'll, they'll, they'll definitely support those. So, is there, is there any questions about, about what I've talked about so far? Or I'm just going to keep moving. Okay, moving on. So this is a really, really, really common question. Is there any guidance about right sizing or scalability or how do you, how, 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 how do you know how many of, uh, of, of a certain, you know, uh, orchestrator role to, to deploy? Um, and here, in this case, again, the, the, there's no set formula, and the reason for that is because a runbook can be as simple or complex as the person decides to make it, right? And so, the more complex the runbooks, the the obviously the more the more <clears throat> the more runbook servers you're going to need. So, um, it, 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 there's 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 not Microsoft guidance around you know if if you're developing. If you're deploying Orchestrator in an environment, you're going to need this many of this and this many of that or this many. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit different than CM and some of those other products be, just because the load that it's going to bear is so wildly divergent. Um, and so it's sort of one of those, there, there's guides around what hardware you should be deploying um, and, and how much you should be allocating to SQL and how much you should be allocating to, to the Rumble servers and, and, the, and those types of things. But But as far as how many of these do I need, um, it's really it's really going to depend on, on how complex and, and, and how often these run books are going to uh, run. And so the, sort of the, the guidance is that there is no guidance. And the, the guidance really is you, you kind of have to keep an eye on it and monitor monitor your infrastructure and sort of do it that way. You know, kind of the, the way that, you know, VMM does, you know, just in time provisioning of, of systems or just in time capacity provisioning, it's kind of like one of it's kind of the same theory that you just kind of kind of keep an eye on your infrastructure and when it looks like it may be slowing down, you might want to add a few more run books or, or run book servers or, or or that sort of thing. So that, so that unfortunately, there's no you know magic calculator to, to figure it out. It's just it's really going to depend on, on the load.
can data be passed from one book to another? Um, yes and no. So not natively. Um, so uh, for folks that are familiar with Orchestrator, there's uh, a thing called a data bus, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, inside the data, it, it, it's kind of a magical thing. It's kind of it stays in memory, and when um, you know actions are performed inside of run books, um, they create information in the data bus and that information can be passed passed from 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 one activity to the next activity it's just in, it's sort of that data bus sort of lives and dies inside that run book now there's a caveat to this and folks have found these found workarounds to this and, and what and, and what you can do right is you can create data somewhere and then pick it up from another run book in other words if you want you can't use the internal data bus to do it, but you could store it in a file, you could store it in SQL, you could store it in some other place that could be programmatic, programmatically accessed. And that's sort of the workaround to, to passing data from one book, run book to the next. And I know there's a lot of times where um, you create these series of run books and you really do need to <clears throat> get sort of state information or um, calculated information or whatever from one run book to the next and that's sort of the way that the industry has been doing it is is dropping it in a file or dropping it in SQL or, 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 or you know writing, writing that data out somewhere um, else. Um, one of the other questions that I've gotten that's very similar to this is can you sort of dump the all the information that's in the data bus somewhere and again yes and no um, you could, in theory, um, which would be a lot of work, um, basically grab, you know, subscribe to the data and then parse it out and put it put it somewhere. Um, and there's a very there's there's some unsupported things. I mean, that you can there's ways to access that data outside of, outside of the run book, but Microsoft doesn't support it. Um, in talking with one of the developers, they're like, it, the problem with that is. Is that it can it can corrupt it can corrupt the 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 data bus if you if you try to do it you know sort of outside outside the the runbook mechanism, and so in theory you can't really dump the data sort of dump everything that's in the data bus, um, but you could you could subscribe to that data, um, especially the data that you really wanted to 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 persist. You could subscribe to that data and then push it you know store it store it in SQL or whatever using a, a SQL activity. Hi, this is Nick. I'll just uh, add on to that if you don't mind. Um, sure, sure. The, the one exception to that is if you've got a uh, a run book actively triggering another run book, then you know using the initialized data activity and the uh, return data activity you can pass data back and forth between the the two run books that are actively triggering each other and then returning data back to the one that triggered it. Correct. Uh, that yeah, way, yeah. That, that that's true. Yeah, that, that that's true. You can. I mean, th this is more about. And thank you, Nick, for for that clarification. Yeah, this was more about um, lots of data, right? <laughs> A lot of times, for for instance, the the, the example that, that comes to mind is um, again that that example I gave you, where you where you where you're building where you're building machines out of your automating the, the, the build of machines and. Um, you need to know the IPs of a bunch of different systems. The, the, the only the, the limitation of that um, initialized data return data thing is it's really it's it's like a. I don't think you can have more than than one piece of data to my knowledge, unless that's changed in SP one. But initially, um, it, it, when you initial when you initialize data and return data, it's it's a it's a, it's a a piece of data. You can't have like a number of different. You, you can, yeah. You can have more than one piece. Of, you can have more than one piece of data, but you do have to explicitly define the data that you want to pass back and forth. So you have to say, uh, you can't. You could. You'd have to set everything up manually. You could bring everything that's generated from one run book to another. You just have to explicitly say, these are the pieces of data I want to pass from this run book to one that was triggered, and then I want to return this data from the triggered run book back to the parent. So you've got to set it all up manually, but you can pass multiple pieces of data if you need to. For instance, okay. 
you know, in a in a VM creation scenario, if, if you need to pass a host and maybe a computer name and uh, an amount of memory to a child run book, that's actually going to generate. Oh, okay. The VM. I, I'm sorry. Okay, so we're we're sort of saying the same thing, only different. Yeah. Yes. Whatever's whatever name value pair is in the 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 current data bus, you can pass it forward. Mm -hmm. the, the issue is, when, especially when you, ha when, when you have um, cyclic recurrences inside of a runbook, mm -hmm. the, the data bus only holds the latest, uh, what I'm saying is it only holds the latest set of information. Right, yeah. Okay, so what, if you're cycling through and, and, and that, you, you, you lose, you lose whatever you, so in other words, if a runbook does it 15 times, it's going to hold the last one, but not the 14 before it. Yes, yeah, absolutely. That, that's, I guess that's what I'm talking about. So, but thank you, yeah, thanks, thanks for the clarification, Nick. Yeah, if, you, if, you're, if you're creating a bunch of state changes, the, 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 the data bus only holds the, the, the very last state, you can't, um, you can't persist the 14 other runs that you've done, especially if you're doing something recursive. But, um, as Nick mentioned, anything that's in the existing, the current, Set of stuff in the in the data bus you can you can pass it, um, but it's, again if the the other issue with that 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 we've run into is if if you need to if you need to persist this is sort of a thing with the with the data bus as well if you if you need to persist information and the run book has a failure for whatever reason you lose that data so so one of the other techniques that we've used before in the past is. Um, for stuff that's sort of critical for us to understand and persist, and we want to maintain that state, um, to sort of write, write it out somewhere as well, just in case we get a catastrophic failure in the run book, we still we know what state we were in when it failed, and we can actually just return to that state. Can Orchestrator integrate with non-Windows environments? Yes, actually, it can. Um, the thing, the, the, again, the caveat here is um, there's not like a you know, an integration pack for uh, Unix, for example. What what it can do is if if the the non Windows environments are exposed in a way that's consumable by typical mechanisms, then it can integrate with them. For example, um, you know, obviously, obviously there are um, platform independent kind of kind of things like. HTTP, for example, or you know, um, web services. But, but even if you know, if if there's other API sets that are connectable through through any sort of any sort of protocol that that's agnostic to the to the platform that it's using, then then you can then 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 it's certainly fine, right? SMTP. I mean, any protocol any protocol that doesn't really care whether what what the underlying platform is would be integratable with with Orchestrator. Um, I don't know. I, I don't think services for Unix is is is, is, is supported. For SFU is supported by Microsoft any longer, um, but cer certainly you know <clears throat> PowerShell has some capabilities to connect to non Windows systems and, and that sort of thing too. So so anything that that Microsoft offers as a technology or um, e even if it's even if it's you know um, script or binary based. Um, Type of mechanisms that are that are written by third parties. If it's executable inside of a Windows environment, it can be. It can, it can also be used to connect to, to non-Windows environments as well. So, so in theory, you, you could you could have a really, you know, highly heterogeneous environment and still or manage your your business process and, and 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 stuff like that with Orchestrator as long as the systems that you're connecting to have some way to be managed by a Windows system programmatically. Are there any questions about that? And lastly, does, does Orchestrator have built-in reporting? Um, no, it doesn't really. Um, it, it, <clears throat> there's, there's, there are um, uh, logging activities that you can do. Um, there are, there, there is reporting on the, you know, um, the failure state of of a of a particular runbook. But as far as you know, what you'd expect, you know. The type of reporting that that I would expect to see. I'm mean, hopefully they'll they'll 
start developing this stuff in, in future versions. But the kind of stuff that I would expect to see where, you know, those executive dashboards and stuff, you know, the, and the stuff for operations folks to, to see when they've got a fairly large orchestrated environment, how, how everything's sort of running. Um, no, there isn't any built-in reporting. You'd have to, you'd have to develop that yourself. Um, and you'd have to, you know, sort of <clears throat> parcel logging and stuff like that in order to create those dashboards. Um, I'm hoping that in future versions that, that, they, that they do build some sort of dashboard to, to see what this, the overall state of, of the execution for uh, a, a complex orchestrator environment is. Um, I, I know that it's on their roadmap. I just don't know when it's going to come. So for the in the meantime, though, you you just have to you just kind of have to build them yourself. I haven't really even seen a lot out in the in the community as far as as, as that goes in, in terms of people building reports for this. Um, but I've 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 seen customers ask for it, but I haven't seen a lot of activity in terms of of folks exposing that or or putting it in the community or, or that sort of thing. Nick Pete, have you guys seen that out there? I, I certainly haven't. Um, I, I know the customers would like to see it. I know that the ops folks would like to see it, but I just haven't seen a lot of activity there. No, I, unfortunately, I haven't either. Yeah, and it, it, it is a feature that we would definitely desire. Um, because, like you said, it is difficult to build those reports yourself. And, and some of that, especially in a large orchestrator environment, would, would be critical so you can understand better what's going on in your environment. Some of it you can build in. You can build in your own error checking into a run book so that if it fails, it doesn't just fail quietly. It can let somebody know, but um, that's not that's not 100% foolproof anyway. So so better reporting is definitely on our list of desires. But I haven't seen a third party solution that that meets that yet. Yeah, no, neither have I. And, and like I said, I mean, we, uh, I, in the past, I've done it with you know, like you say, the air, the the, the air reporting and the and the and the logging integration pack. But um, and we we had to kind of you know spoon spoon through that parse through that stuff and build our own reports and stuff like that. But I haven't, I, like I said, I haven't seen um, a lot of activity on this front. And and it seems to, it seems to be a growing need. So I'm hoping I'm hoping Microsoft is you know working on it. So that's all the all the questions we have, um, or at least inside of our FAQ. I'd love to you know hear from you guys to see if there's any other additional questions that you have. So yeah, feel free to use the chat box or I am to enter questions. You can also unmute yourself. In the interim, I guess uh, I just want to recap with uh, Pete and Nick. Uh, if you could just give us a sort of bullet list of what are the top um, orchestrator. Um, Automations relative to service managers. What are the key things that, are, that people are asking for? Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that come up pretty consistently. Um, the most common thing is probably using Orchestrator to send email notifications. Mm -hmm. The email notification infrastructure and service manager is pretty robust, but there are certain things that it can't handle. Um, and you know, the, the most common example of this is probably. Uh, Emailing folks when service level objectives breach or go into a warning status. You can do that from Service Manager, but you lose some flexibility on filtering the kinds of SLOs you're going to trigger on. Orchestrator lets you have unlimited flexibility, so we are only sending emails when it's a resolution SLO and not a response SLO or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, we've done some internal automation where we're automatically routing incidents or automatically closing resolved incidents those sorts of things that build into a, an existing incident or service request management process. Um, and we've also done some of the cross-platform automation where service requests that are generated in Service Manager go and do some work outside of Service Manager, like creating users in Active Directory, for instance. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably also worth noting, and this goes back to James' first question, a lot of people don't know what Orchestrator is or what it does, and further, they're not sure where Service Manager ends, the, the workflow infrastructure and Service Manager ends, and Orchestrator begins. So we see some customers assuming that they can automate things in Service Manager um, that, that they can't, that would require Orchestrator, or they assume the opposite, that Service Manager has little or no automation capability, and they'll need Orchestrator to do things that Service Manager actually does natively. So I guess my point being that there's a lack of clarity. Um, and um, one of the things that we try to do 
early on with customers is educate them as to here's what you can do natively in Service Manager. Here's why Orchestrator is probably a good idea. And Nick highlighted some of the things that are um, you know fairly straightforward to do in Orchestrator. They extend Service Manager nicely. They also provide, and actually, James, this is a question I have for you, is um, they provide a good starting point for uh, organizations if they don't have any exposure to Orchestrator and aren't sure what to do with it. So I guess my question to you is, do you have um, ideas for good starting points if somebody wanted to, to get started with Orchestrator? It's not, I know it's not a big deal to install, but I think a lot of folks don't know exactly what they would do with it to begin with. I think we might have lost James. James, you there? Maybe he's muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I, I, I think from a starting point, there, there's a couple things you want to do. So the first, the first thing I, well, I, I'll tell you what you don't want to do is, is you don't want to replace like an enterprise batch system with Orchestrator. It's really kind of not what it's supposed to do. I mean, you can, but um, what what you want to try? I, I tell anybody who's looking at Orchestrator, really, what you want to evaluate is <clears throat> any sort of business processes that are currently being perceived by your 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 organization as inefficient or taking too long or um, not not operating, you know, properly. That, that's that's where you want to kind of look at Orchestrator. I mean, it, it, like you say, it, it can extend your existing products, but what where, where the real power, I think, of Orchestrator comes in is where, when you have to traverse different technologies and systems, right? That It really is a glueware, if you want to call it that, for, for, for certain business processes. A lot of times people have, you know, homegrown applications, and they've got that, that, that a process will traverse a homegrown application, you know, up through, you know, maybe... Um, Service Manager, right? So um, somebody cuts a ticket in Service Manager, but they have to. People have to do work in another system in order to accomplish that ticket. There, there's that's what Orchestrator's real power is: is to be able to, to, to take that sort of manual work or, or that integration between systems and to sort of facilitate that and and, and, and automate it. Okay. Does that does that help, or was that sort of too high level? Well, I guess one of my questions is: is there is there anything obvious? Um, I hate to use the term low-hanging fruit, but I guess I, I'm, I'm wondering if there's something, some sort of AD automation that it, that provides um, a, an excellent use case for Orchestrator that's accessible to somebody who doesn't really have any experience with it. Um, yeah, actually, so again, I, I mentioned this earlier. There, <clears throat> excuse me. There, there's out on CodePlex and in some of the other some of the other developer community sites, people have written. Um, these more common run books. Um, so, so, some of them are around, you know, um, what, what you call system engineering type, type of activities, which, you know, which is sort of the care and feeding of servers and systems and um, where, you know, things like um, when you have to do repetitive action against a bunch of different systems and you want to work off a list or whatever, it's really easy to do that. You can do it in the script, but, it, but it's pretty easy to do it in Orchestrator. You can get proper logging. You can get good control. You can do inputs and outputs on that. And so um, if you're harvesting information or if you're if you're trying to um, do care and feeding of, of systems, if there, there's sort of these repetitive, you know, kind of scheduled activities or ad hoc activities, that's sort of low-hanging fruit. Um, and like I said, a lot of times these things are um, – somebody's already developed a run book for them, so um, – they can go ahead, and <clears throat> um, go ahead and get them from the community. Uh, I would say that the real low-hanging fruit is if you've got scripts that you're using today, right? That are that are and not like the simple scripts where you sort of like you know you execute script and you put do one input, but but if but you have a scripting environment that that's fairly complex and there's, there's a lot of um, institutional knowledge about this how the scripts run, but nobody really knows how the whole thing sort of works together. That's that's where I would sort of start is 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 going after the sort of that that SE kind of scripting environment kind of operational type of activities that are are sort of causing people fits today because nobody completely understands the environment. And you can convert all of those scripts into Orchestrator fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. So that, that sounds like a good answer. You've got to uh, take what you have in terms of scripts, harvest them in, get them into a more structured environment with Orchestrator. Um, 
And then secondly, I think the first point you made was uh, look for uh, look at CodePlex and other sources for remediations and activities, basic care and feeding maintenance things that you uh, that are relevant to you, and you can harvest those. And then and then then after that, you can look at more more custom. Yeah, more complex business process. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I, I'll go for the, the simple stuff first, like Nick said, you know, um, and that, that's really mo most of the simple stuff people have written scripts around, and either they're comfortable with those scripts or they're not, but but a lot of times um, Orchestrator provides a much better mechanism for, for that for that kind of execution than, than the script does because there's so there's there's a lot of limitations about what, what those scripts can do. Okay. So we're, we are out of time. Uh, I see that Nick is handling a question from, from Andy in the IM window. If there are further questions, you can always email us at info at This uh, recording will be posted at um, uh, YouTube for Acceleris. If you have comments or feedbacks, uh, feel free to, to ping us at info at .com. Thanks for joining. Hey, thanks so much, James, for your, your time. Hey, no worries. Thanks, guys. Thanks, James.